been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me Well, good morning. Welcome to the German Church. We're so glad you're here to worship with us. Well, happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers out there from the Journey Church family. To you, happy Mother's Day. We hope you have an awesome day and an awesome year. Well, the title of today's message is A Mother's Love. A Mother's Love. There's nothing quite like a mother's love. But please allow me to start off our message today with a caring and comforting word. I have been in ministry now for 24 years. And over that length of time, I've come to realize that so many women struggle with Mother's Day. There are many women who will not go to church on Mother's Day because of some major pain they still feel from their past. Maybe their mom gave them up for adoption. Maybe their mom was just a very poor mother in raising them. Maybe their mom passed away and so they still really miss her a lot. Maybe they had a child pass away. Maybe they've had a child that has hurt them and walked away in disobedience and said very hurtful things to them. Maybe they want to be a mother but have never been able to have or bear children. And seeing other women with children and being recognized as a mother is just too hard. Maybe they have had an abortion in the past but they have not yet dealt with that before the Lord. There could be many other reasons, but the fact is many women and mothers struggle with Mother's Day each and every year. If this is you, I want you to know that I care deeply for your pain and your sorrow. I hope the Lord Jesus Christ will walk with you through your pain and sorrow and bring comfort and healing to your heart and life. That said, I would like for us to turn in our Bibles to the well-known chapter in Proverbs known as Proverbs 31. We will be in Proverbs 31 verses 10 through 31, and this specific passage of Scripture is known as the Proverbs 31 woman. You know, women and mothers are very unique. Why are they unique? It's because our wonderful Lord, who is a creator, made women and mothers very unique. Unique. Women and mothers are very special. Before we read verses 10 through 31, do you know who is speaking here? You might need to know who is speaking. Let's go back up to verse 1 before we start in verse 10. Quote, the words of King Lemuel, the oracle his mother taught him. So what you're about to read in verses 10 through 31 in Proverbs chapter 31 is coming from a king whose mother taught him what it was like to recognize a good woman, a godly woman, a good mother, a godly mother, a good wife, a godly wife. He gave, she gave him a picture of what to look for and to seek after for himself. And then, of course, God is the one that is through the Holy Spirit had him pin this down so that every generation would know what it's like uh, for women and mothers to live. Here we come to understand what a good and godly and virtuous woman is from a wise mother herself. The Lord helped this mother become a godly woman herself, and now she is teaching her young son the picture of the type of woman he should desire. Let's look at Proverbs 31, 10 through 31 right now. The subtitle for this is called The Description of a Worthy Woman. Verse 10, an excellent wife you can find for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusted her. We don't just start out with women having children. We start out with a woman getting married and having a husband and then having children. Today in our society, we have so many people getting the cart in front of the horse and having all of these babies before they ever follow through with the covenant of matrimony. And so this woman says, look, first of all, she's a good woman, but then she becomes a good wife, and then she can become a good mother. Verse 11, the heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. If you go over to another part of Proverbs, there's a scripture where it says a woman can tear down her husband and destroy her marriage. There's a lot of women that do that. They cut their husbands down. They don't respect their husbands. They don't lift up their husbands. They don't encourage their husbands. They're not there to uh, walk alongside their husband. It's always nag, 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 or 
Complain, 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 or blame, blame, blame. And all that's doing is just chopping the legs right out from under him. But that's not what this kind of woman does. The heart of her husband trusts in her. It is special when a man can trust his wife. It's not cool when a husband can't trust his wife. He will have no lack of gain. A worthy woman is going to be one that brings gain to her husband, gain to the marriage. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Why do we have so many separations and divorces? Because both the wife and the husband are doing evil to one another. They're doing things that are not of Christ. Let me ask you a question. If a husband is doing what's right unto her husband, would there be a separation? No. What if the husband is doing right to his wife as the Lord would command? Would there be a separation and divorce? No. When we do what God says, we would have wonderful marriages. Verse 13, she looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. This woman knows how to use her hands. This woman knows how to roll up the sleeves and she knows how to put on a an apron and work. I grew up around a grandmother, a great grandmother, a grandmother and my mother, and I've seen all three of these women wearing aprons. And I've seen them working very hard. So whether they work out in a corporate office, whether they work on a farm, whether they're working inside the home, they're still working. But this woman here, the virtuous woman, the godly woman, she looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. Did you know she's not complaining about working? A lot of women complain about working. Whether it's out in the corporate world or whether it's working in the home or whether it's taking care of her husband or whether it's taking care of the kids. Complain, complain, complain. A godly woman, a good woman, a virtuous woman doesn't complain about the role that she has that's God-given. Never complain, but work in delight. Verse 14, she is like merchant ships and brings her food from afar. And a lot of times we used to get our food from the garden, so I know what it's like to have to bring in food. My mother was right out there right beside me and my dad. And my grandmother we were, were planting food and harvesting, and it was hot, it was dirty work, back break work. Now, you can just order your food online, but it's still got to be ordered. You still have to go get it. You still have to bring it home. You may have to shop for it. You still got to clean it. You still got to cook it. And so there's still things to be done to put food on the table. But she brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household. I've never had a time in my life where my great-grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, or my wife would not take a moment and feed me. I, I, I used to come over at my grandmother's home late at night, and uh, I'd be out, I was in my college years, and I couldn't swing by. Now, now this was so sad, I shouldn't have more respect. I couldn't roll her out, knock it on the door at 1 a.m. 1 a.m., grandmother! She said, hold on a minute. And she's kind of trying to get her hair dead on and get her ground on and whatever, and come to the door. I'm like, hey, how you doing? She said, I'm good, what are you doing up? Well, wow, she's out real, my friend. Man, I'm hungry, I'm starving. Well, let me see what I got. I can't tell you how many pancakes my grandmother cooked me at 1 a.m. in the morning. Right? So there was always, and every time I was around, she said, Son, you're hungry. Son, you're hungry. Is there anything I can do? Biscuits? There were always biscuits on the table. And so she was constantly wanting to make sure her grandson uh, was fed. She gives food to her household and forces to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it from her earnings. She plants a vineyard. My uh, grandmother used to buy and sell timber, buy and sell land. I mean, when she see a piece of property, she'd buy it up. And so she would hold on to it and say, never sell, son. They're not making any more land. So you buy it up, never sell, always buy. And she know how to look over a piece of timber and look over land and be able to say, I know how much this is worth. They're charging too much for it. This is a great deal. And as a school teacher, she was saving her money. While my grandfather was paying a lot of the bills, she would take her money and buy a piece of property, buy a piece of land. So she could actually do what's right here in Proverbs 31. Verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. And from her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her game is good and her lamp does not grow out at night. This woman doesn't sit around and eat bonbons and watch Oprah. This woman is a godly, virtuous woman. This woman is taking care to take care of her body, make sure her body is strong for working out the calling of the Lord as a wife and a mother. Verse 19, she stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. Our wives a lot of times and mothers a lot of times don't make our clothes anymore. But my great-grandmother, my grandmother, would make clothes and things for the children. A lot of times we buy them now, but they would sit down. I still have my mother's, grandmother's mother's, my grandmother, her sewing machine. It's in our dining room. I still can just watch her just in my mind. I can close my eyes and I can watch her total the little lamp 
right above the uh, sewing machine and just watch her pump that pedal and get that thing going. And next thing you know, she's she backed it up. I can see everything, even the thimbles on her hand. I can see all of that. I'm so thankful to see that. And she was just working, bent over there, just kind of making it. Anything that I tore, she could fix. She had a different color thread. I watched her thread needles and just watched her work on that sewing machine. Verse 20, she extends her hand to the floor and she stretches out her hands to the needle. My great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, and my wife would always make sure that if there was someone in need, we would give food or clothing or money to somebody. In the verses 21 and following, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes covering for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. It used to bug me to death, but my grandmother and my mother would not let me go out of the house without a super big coat on. Things muffed around my face that I had on. You had to have a hat because you lose most of the heat in your body through your head. And so I would go out kind of like the Michelin guy, you know, so I had all this stuff on, but I get to school sometimes and you see kids in short sleeve shirts, you didn't see jackets on them, I'm like, hey, where's your mother? Maybe your mother should have made you look like me, you know, but they're freezing, whereas my mother, of course, as soon as I got to school and got to the bus, I took half of that off. But a mother that's thinking about her children is going to dress them warmly and make sure that they're not going to catch pneumonia and send them off to school and make sure that they're warm. Verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land, my mom treated my dad with great respect. She knew that my dad had a great name in our community. I could go anywhere as a child. This was just so amazing. I could go anywhere as a child, and somebody would be talking to me, and somehow I'd like come around, well, who's your dad? Or I'd share that my dad was Dale White. And I'd be like, oh, Dale is your dad? Really? Your dad's Dale White? Oh, wow. Wow, nice to meet you, son. Their whole demeanor would change once they found out Dale White was my father. My dad had a really good name. My dad was respected. My mom respected my dad. I never heard my mom talk down to my dad or be disrespectful to him, especially out in the public. Verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen, strengthened them into her clothing, and she smiles at the future. I love seeing all the posts that my wife puts on Facebook. Every now on Facebook, some of you ladies that are her friends, you'll see that she's selling coats, she's selling shoes, she's selling purses. They're just things that are sitting around in our closet that could be sold, and that could be money into our home and provide for needs. And so that's another way that my wife can bring in some funds into our home to help provide for our home. Verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Sometimes women open their mouths and say the most horrible of things. I know that sometimes we speak impulsively. I know sometimes we speak from hurt. I know sometimes we speak from anger. But let me tell you something. Once spoken, you can't take it back. You can ask forgiveness. But there's so much hurt done. And a lot of times when moms are hurt, they'll say something that stays with the husband or stays with the child or the grandchild for many years to come. So if you're a mom or a wife today, I pray that you will think through what you're going to say. Be a godly woman. Be a Proverbs 31 woman. She opens her mouth in wisdom. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and is not eat the bread of idleness. Don't be lazy. God does not want to look around and see a woman, a wife, or a mother, or a grandmother being lazy. And my mom just turned 79 on May 2nd, and my mom is still a hardworking woman. So that woman has always set before me the example of hard work. My mother was not idle. And so uh, I don't know what it would have uh, made me think if I was to look back all these years and say, my mother was sure lazy. She just sat on the couch and didn't do anything. Verse 28, her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Now, there are times as people are growing up, children are growing up, they've been given good parents by the Lord, and sometimes those kids are living under themselves, they're selfish, they're not Christ-centered, and they're not giving you the honor and respect due to you, but you were a great mom, and you're actually doing the things in Scripture, that's okay. If you've been doing what God has called you to do, He sees, He knows. And as I've often told my wife, a lot of times as kids grow up, when they hit their 30s and 40s, they start to see their parents a little bit differently. A lot of times when they have their own kids, they go through the same kind of struggles that maybe their parents went through. They're like, oh, 
I see what my dad went through. I see what my mom went through. We start to become a little more grateful, a little more thankful for those parents. And sometimes we reach out a little more. We might phone call our mothers and grandmothers a little bit more often because we get it now. But some of those kids that are far from me right now and you'd love to have more visits, love to have more phone calls, give them another decade. Just pray for them and ask for God to put it on their hearts to love their mothers, especially their mothers and also their fathers. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done no good, but you excel them all. Listen to verse 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Now think about how our society lives today. It's focused on women. Think of magazines. Think of red carpet. Think of Hollywood. Think of all the glamour. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. Did you know that God tells us that charm is deceitful and beauty is vain? That is not how our world promotes women. That charm is necessary. Beauty is absolutely a requirement. And they're talking outward physically. But God said that stuff is deceitful and vain. You're going to waste your life focused on that. Back in the day, back in the country, my grandmother wasn't focused on charm and beauty. She had rows of corn to plant and harvest. She wasn't worried about all the makeup and the hair and the jewelry and the clothing. They would have starved had she worried about all of that. And the same with my grandmother and my mother. So, ladies, take it easier on yourself. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. Don't chase something that's fleeting. Every woman wants to buy the latest product that will make sure that you have no wrinkles until you die. Listen to me. There is no such cream. The people at Nordstrom's, the people at Macy's, the people at Jason Pace that just want your money. We're getting old and we're dying. And did you know, in my opinion, wrinkles are a sign of wisdom. Just like the Bible says, gray hair is a sign of wisdom. So if we're trying to cover it up, my wife talks a little bit about the gray coming into her hair. And I look at her and I say, I think it was beautiful. It's mixed all in with that red. And it looks to me like she's wise. She's been around a while, and she's actually been a great wife, and she's been a great mother to our two boys. And so I just think it looks very pretty. And so I'm like, don't rush to cover it up. That shows that you're growing in the Lord. So I think she's beautiful just the way she is. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Be careful, women, where you seek your praise. If you're seeking your praise from other women than men, then that's going to be fleeting. But why don't you let Jesus Christ praise you? You know what? His praise will never end. He'll praise you throughout all of eternity. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gate. A lot of women are hard workers. But let me ask you this. What type of work are you doing? Are you doing work that God has called you to do, that you are good at, that's blessing your husband, blessing your children and grandchildren? You can do work, but not all of it is going to be productive work. There are times when we've had young ladies in our church, and they would go and take positions out in the world that was a way to make a paycheck, but it was using their body. And they were going to work for companies that used their body to get clientele in. And I'm like, you know what? God made you special. God made you perfect. God made you cute. Don't use that for a paycheck. You need to use the mind he's given you, the heart he's given you, the hands he's given you to do quality work and let your works praise you in the city gates. This type of woman, this godly type of woman has earned her reward of praise. Don't seek to have outside praise. Seek for your husband to praise you. Seek for your children to praise you. Seek for your grandchildren to praise you. Don't seek for people to praise you out in the world because they're going to set you up unto a standard you may not can rise to. I'm amazed that today much of the focus on women is on beauty, a pretty face and a pretty body, fancy clothes, sparkling jewelry, their sex appeal in society, their popularity. Did you know that's all new? That's not the way things used to be. But we're becoming more and more about self. Self, not selfless. We're becoming more about self when we become selfish. This is not the focus of the women that I've had the privilege of seeing as I grew up. I personally come from a strong line of godly women. My great-grandmother, my grandmother, and my mother. All of these three women worked on a farm. The last two, my grandmother and my mother, not only had college degrees, but they both worked on the farm when they got home from their 40-hour-per-week full-time job. So get this. Going to college, being married, and getting a job, having a full-time job, coming home, changing your clothes, 
going down into a hot field and actually getting on your hands and knees and digging things out of the ground, coming in, and my mom would spend all night parching things, shelling things, and uh, my dad and I would too, we'd have big dish pans sitting in our lives shelling purple hole peas or beans or all those kind of things. She would then stand on her feet till nine or ten at night, do all that while she's washing clothes and after she's cooked dinner. So she did all of that and never complained. My grandmother was young in the Great Depression, and she told me how not to be wasteful with money, but to know hard times can come, and it's not fun. She told me the things that they had to eat. They ate the same things that the pigs would eat. And so they would make uh, little sack dresses to be able to go back and forth to school without socks and shoes. There were so many things that she told me about. And here I'm running around with Converse and Nike sneakers and it costs 40, 50 bucks. And every time my white socks would wear out, my grandmother would say, don't you throw those away. You give them to me. My grandmother would walk around with my two socks because they didn't have two socks back then. And you just didn't throw anything away. And she would take all my old socks and just wear it. But at the time, I'm thinking, I'm going to throw those things away. Just go buy some new ones. She goes, son, you don't just go buy new. It has to wear out before you throw it away. And I'm thinking it's worn out. She goes, no, I've seen a couple of three years of those things. <laughs> but she also taught me so much about Jesus and faith in him and the Bible. And she also taught me so much about her example of hard work. My grandmother lived out Proverbs 31 moment example. I remember going out and seeing my grandmother just milking cows. And I thought I was going to go out there and be tough. And I tried to milk a cow. And boy, I'm telling you, my poor arm's hurt. She can milk cow after cow after cow. Then I thought one day I'm going to go out there and help her with the uh, harrowing as she went down the row of her garden. And so I show up. And uh, here I am in the best shape I could possibly. I worked out with the power lifters at Louisiana Tech University. I was slim and trim. And boy, my maxes were high on deadlifts and squats and bench presses, and I showed up listening from having a tan, and I showed up on a tank top, and my grandmother, probably in her 60s at that time, I was out there just uh, going with an old one-horse mule, and she's just going down the rows, and it was a, a furrow that just kind of turned the dirt up, and she's working this thing like this, going all the way, going back and forth, long rows from here all the way into that parking lot, and then she turned around, and she'd go back, she'd wipe her forehead under her body, and she'd just kind of do it again, and she'd already made lots of passes. I should have said, oh, Grandma, Grandma, let me help you with that. Don't, don't, don't kill yourself out here. She starts smiling. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 I got this for you. I don't want you to have to do this. She goes, oh, you want to try? I said, no, no, not try. I can do it. I can do it. I just don't want to see my grandmother right here doing this. Help yourself. And so I got out there and boy, I began giving it the biceps and triceps and the flex. Yeah, just, just flexing everywhere, you know, and just getting to that. I got to the end of that row. <laughs> I was dead. Absolutely dead. I was breathing hard. I could hardly stand. The heat was killing me. My back was hurting. My biceps were popping out. I just couldn't do it. She just over there just giving me this. I said, well, what's so funny? She goes, son. I said, I just don't know how you do it. How do you do that? I mean, I just got proven that I couldn't do it. It was just a real slam to my humanity and my masculinity. And she said, son, I've been doing this all my life. I'm conditioned for it. You're not conditioned for it. And plus, I know how to work the thing. You're just manhandling it. I know how to make one more fuel work for me. You're trying to make it work for you. So I just learned so many life lessons that older people may can do a whole lot more things than you can do. So age was not necessarily a factor. My mother taught me so much about Jesus and faith in him in the Bible, but she also taught me so much about her example of hard work. My mother lived out the Proverbs 31 woman example. Therefore, it is no wonder that I was led by the Lord to find that same type of woman to be my wife and the mother of my children. Lana lives out the Proverbs 31 woman example just like they did. When I watch Lana on a daily basis, I am absolutely amazed at how one woman can possibly do all that she does. And she does all of this as she battles several different types of medical conditions. She is one of the hardest working women I have ever seen. And oftentimes she goes straight to bed very, very tired. Thank you, honey, for all that you do for our family. Here are some easy bullet points of how to be a Proverbs 31 woman and or mother. Number one, surrender to and worship the Lord Jesus Christ above all. Surrender to and worship the Lord Jesus Christ above all. A Proverbs 31 woman must, must, love and serve Jesus more and before she serves her husband and children. 
Why? Because he is God. To reverse this order, to love your husband and your children more than Jesus, is to put others before him. Number two, work hard at providing for your husband. Number two, work hard at providing for your husband. Your husband is to come before your children in your love and devotion. Now, many women and mothers do not like hearing that, but it is biblically true. A woman is in a covenant before God with her husband, not with her children. Also, a good and godly woman will build up her husband and be his cheerleader as he goes out into a rough and tough world to provide for and protect his family. My wife will sometimes say to me, go get him, Tiger. And I can't tell you what that means to me for her to say that. One of my love languages is encouraging words. So when she texts me that or tells me that or gives me an uh, encouraging word, or gives me a kiss on the cheek, go get him, Tiger. I feel like I can take on the world. It doesn't matter what's happening. But if she's more like, man, you're just lazy. Man, you're just no good. Man, you're just sorry. Don't wonder my daddy didn't like you. You know, all those kind of things. If she wants to say phrases like that, that wouldn't be helpful. But she says, go get him, Tiger. Here's another one. I'm so proud of you for providing far home. And so that makes me feel very uh, thankful that God's given me the ability to go out and work. Number three, work hard pointing your children toward Jesus. Number three, work hard pointing your children toward Jesus. There is always so much to do as a mom, such as making money, saving money, spending money wisely, buying meals, cooking meals, keeping your children moving forward in their education, Providing the nurturing to children that can best come from a mother. Providing secondary disciplinarian support to the children because the husband is the primary disciplinarian in the home. By the way, this is one of the reasons single mothers struggle so much with their children and their disobedience if the father has not been there being the primary disciplinarian. Note, if a mother does not first and foremost point all of her children to Jesus Christ, and get their little young lives going and growing in Jesus, then no matter what she does later in their lives, will not mean half as much because they are not following the Lord Jesus Christ. Mothers, sit with your children and open the Bible and teach them how to study the Bible and how to come to know Jesus through his word. Sit and teach your children how to pray. Teach your children to say, I'm sorry. Teach them how to repent when they sin and how to ask other people for forgiveness and also how to ask God for his forgiveness. And mothers, please get your children in the habit of going to church regularly to sit beside you in worshiping Jesus so that they will one day go to church and worship and serve him all the rest of their lives. Proverbs 22, 6 teaches us this. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Did you know that we've got young people leaving the church of Jesus Christ in groves? But if you've taught them to go to church, even if they have a little bit of a prodigal time in their life, the Bible is true, they will come back. It's because that's their training. So moms... Regardless of whatever else you do in the home, if you're not raising up godly children to Christ, showing them how to study, how to pray, how to ask forgiveness, how to share their faith, how to come and sit and worship, then you're doing them a huge disservice. Ladies, one final word for emphasis. Don't worry about how pretty or how powerful or how popular you are. Worry more about how kind how supported, how worshipful, and how servant-hearted you are. This gets the attention of Jesus instead of the attention of other women and other men. On May 2nd, just a week and a half before Mother's Day, the Lord really moved powerfully and painfully in my life. My mom, on her 79th birthday, on May 2nd, a week and a half ago, had a major heart attack. Woke up that morning, 6.30, started having all kinds of chest pains and Shortness of breath, sweating, all of the typical symptoms a woman feels when she's having a heart attack and she lives alone. And so she had to just grab that phone and call 911 from the time she hit the button to call 911 to the time they had her doing four stents. And a surgery was 37 minutes. I mean, it was fast. 
And so they got her in there, found out she had 100% blockage on one side. They did four stents. She was already out of recovery by the time we got there. And so that was just a big shock. My wife and I and child were just kind of getting our head around this whole situation. Well, then in four more days, now she's calling me at 12.07 a.m. in the morning screaming on the phone because she's got massive pain, especially her right leg, with both of her legs. I've never seen my mother in excruciating pain screaming. Never. I just got dressed as fast as I could. I got to the hospital. I could barely just keep her in the bed without the tying her down. Massive amounts of pain. My mother has always been there for all of my falls and breaks and hurts and issues and the crying and the holding and the hugging and telling me it'll be okay. I've never had to return that favor to be there by my mother's bedside with all of the pain that she was experiencing with that blood clot as it was in her abdomen. It was blocking all the blood flow in her. She, she felt like her legs, she said, was going to explode and make them do something. I could beg them for more pain medication, but they couldn't give her because they already had her something. They could give her too much and her heart and blood pressure were already so low. And then they took her in, they gave her the report about what can happen if you go in for this surgery. So one out of five, lose a limb, or one out of five, die. Okay, that's pretty high odds, right? 20%. So they take her off, she's in surgery, I get her reports from the nurses and she's doing fine after she went into surgery at 3.25 a.m. and came out at 7.05. And so she came back, they brought her back to the room. Well, as they brought her back to the room, I walked in the ICU room, and she was right there, and she just had this blank look on her face. She just had a glassy look. As I walked up to her, I said, hi, Mom, how you doing? And she just was non-responsive. She didn't smile. She didn't wave. She didn't blink. She didn't speak. So I just kind of stepped out of the room. I could tell things weren't right. And then I hear the nurses saying, what's your name? Can you tell us your name? All right, please tell us your name. Do you know your name? What's your birthday? They're asking her all that. She has no, she's no response. They must have asked her what her name was 15 times. I went, something is bad, wrong. The nurse ran outside and she said, something's not right. I ordered a CT scan of her head. She's not responding. So anyway, I've already been told about how severe this could be. And she's 79 years old. So they rush her off. And at that point, I'm losing it. I mean, I, I'm a man. I do cry. Real men cry. But uh, there were just so many nurses and doctors standing around. I just kind of walked off down the side. And I walked around the corner, and there was a big window standing in the corner of the hospital. And I just lost it. I just said, well, today's the day I leave my mother. My dad already died 25 years ago, but I still had my mother. And so I was just standing there just losing it before the Lord. Just tears were flowing, and I was just realizing I'm about to lose my mom. I may have already lost her. Whatever I just said to her, that was the last thing I could say to her. And so they had her for a while, and when she came back, I it was quite a while. They finally brought her back. And it's, I didn't really want to go back in there. Even when they brought her back, I just didn't want to go back in there because I couldn't face talking to her and her not responding, her not saying anything, her not smiling, her not recognizing me. And I'm like, well, I've got to go back in there. I walked back in there. I said, hi, Mom. And she gave me a little wave. I said, yes. And then she kind of waved a little bit, and a little smile creeped over. I said, wow. So me or the doctors, nobody knows why things turned around as they did, but God gave me a little bit more time. I don't already grieved the loss of my mother standing in that window. I thought it was over. But God, some reason, in His divine sovereignty, gave me a little bit more time with my mother. Oh, make good use of that. If your mother is still alive, call her today. Don't wait and say, I wish there were things I would have said, because you can't get that time back. I want to call my mother more. I want to see my mother more. I was already calling her, texting her, and I was always taking her out to a lunch somewhere. I want to do more of that. I want to hear more of her stories. I want to build more uh, memories with her. So God gave me little bit more time. But even if God takes her today, I'm prepared. I'm ready for God to take her if he wants to. But my mom has done her job. My great-grandmother did her job. My grandmother did her job. My mother did her job. And so now, I have chosen wisely. But that's what we all need to be doing. There's so many people out there not choosing wisely. And everybody that God brings into our church family, we need to help them become a Proverbs 31 woman. You're not born a Proverbs 31 woman. We become a Proverbs 31 woman with biblical study and teaching and preaching and worship music and discipleship. Amen? Let's help more women. Can you imagine what our world would be like if we had more Proverbs 31 women, wives and mothers out there in the world? What would life be like? This would be a very different world. We need more godly wives and mothers. Amen? Ask God what he can do in you and through you to bring about that life change for more ladies. Amen.